Good morning. I'm glad that you guys can join us this morning. Um, just a quick update on, on when we may be able to get back together. We are working on some things right now of, of a combination of both, maybe doing some online a couple weeks and then some outdoor, maybe some indoor. Um, but just be patient with us and, and we'll kind of see where all that goes. But this morning, let's just worry about worshiping this morning. Let's worry about praising God for the things that he has given us, the things that he has done for us. Um, more, most importantly, the gift that he gave us through his son's death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. So let's start off in prayer, and I'll turn it over to Amber. Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Father, I thank you for an opportunity through your son's death, burial, and resurrection that we can come to you. There, there's nothing in our way. We don't have to go through an intermediary and, and, and some, some middleman to get to you. Lord, we get to come to you personally. And, and the scripture tells us that, that Jesus is praying on our behalf right now because of that. And we come to celebrate that this morning. We come to worship that, that this morning. Not, not what we think you can do for us, but what you did for us. Lord, fill the homes of the people that are watching. Fill this room this morning. Um, fill my soul, Amber's soul, as, as we lead people to, to see you. And Lord, I pray this morning that church in the village just sees a glimpse of what heaven's going to be. We give you all the glory for what's going to happen today. And we ask this in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever
in our life and some of this that, that allows us to seek you more. Lord, I pray. I pray for my own life this morning as, as we dig into to Luke 19 and, and look a little bit about what worship really is and, and why we should worship and, and, and what, what we should worship you for. Lord, let me speak to myself this morning. Speak to my heart. Fill me with your presence and your new wine. Lord, and I thank you so much for who you are and who you're always going to be. We ask this in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Amber. Um, three of my favorite things. Uh, I was mowing the grass Friday, and Amber sent me some songs yesterday, and there was a song that came on, the first song we sung, Death Was Arrested, and uh, I was like, well, we haven't sung that in a long time at church, and Amber sent that to me yesterday, and it just kind of, it works that way somehow. I don't know why it works that way, but it does work that way. Um, <clears throat> first things first, um, 
just so you know, I didn't forget what tomorrow is. And, and so I want to say I'm thankful for, for every veteran, my dad, who served in the Vietnam, but also for those that gave the ultimate sacrifice to protect our freedoms here. And, and want to wish you a happy Memorial Day as we remember those that, that gave their life. And we remember those that, that, um, that we've lost, the loved ones that we lost, that, that, um, that we no longer have next to us. But, but happy Memorial Day to all the veterans out there, to, um, to the families that have lost um, soldiers that never came home. And uh, we want to celebrate that with you um, tomorrow. And um, so normally I would have you stand up if you're a veteran and all that, but can't really do that today. So if you are, just know Church in the Village loves you. And we respect and honor everything that you did for us. Um, that song, before I get started, that song, New Wine, I was preaching at a youth camp two years ago, and they sung it. And um, <clears throat> and I just started reading. I just started hearing that song. And and so I, I, I started researching. And, and what wine was really used for, when they, when they used it, it was more of a, <clears throat> it, it, not in the literal sense, but there was a, just kind of a, a picture that was painted whenever they, they used the term wine in, in the Hebrew culture, it kind of meant joy, right? So when you listen to that song and you hear that song and you, you, you think of how wine's made the crushing and the pressing, but out of it, there is a new joy that comes out of that because you know who led you through that. So that's always one of my favorite songs, especially in this time um, as I pray in my life, just through the crushing sometimes in my own brain and my own heart, you know, lead us to some new joy in our life, and and I pray that for you. I know this time is a weird time for everybody. Um, people are, it's, it's like life back to normal for some, for some it's not, um, and, and I, before I do get started, I want you to understand, it's okay whatever you decide. They, they, nobody's dictating to you what you should do in this life. All you should do as a father, follower is, is simply do this. Trust God in that process. That means follow Him. Do what He asks you to do through all of it. And I found myself walking with Nicole the other night, and I know I'm not even starting my sermon. I'll get there, I promise. And I found myself getting angry, right? Like, ah, oh, man, we, what's going on here? We meet in schools. Schools aren't going to be open for a long time. Our school's getting demolished, all this stuff, right? And, and then I realized that <clears throat> we're not called to dictate what happens. We're called to love God and love others through everything that happens. So just focus on the call no matter what's going on around you. Um, so, so just so you know, with me personally, I've been trying to seek that new joy, that, that joy in the calling that God gave me because I'm confused. I'm, I'm anxious. I'm, I'm like, I don't know what to do here, right? So you're not alone. Um, so let me start. Let's dig in to Luke 19. And uh, one of my favorite sections of Scripture, which we probably should have preached a few weeks ago because it's Palm Sunday. Um, it's what we celebrate on Palm Sunday. But I remember one time um, when I was growing up, I was at a church. My dad was on staff at a church, and we had a pastor and a dear friend, probably still a dear friend today, and a and, um, dear friend of my dad's. And I shouldn't say probably today. If I saw him out there, I would have a conversation with him. And uh, <clears throat> it was his birthday. Now at this church, it was it wasn't customary, but it was, you know, it it was just they they kind of poked fun of you a little bit when they. I remember one time they put a toupee on my dad's head at a party they gave for him, which was which, which was really weird to see my dad with hair, um, and because uh, I've never seen him with, I mean that haircut's the same one that he always has. So this this friend of mine who was a pastor um, at this church, um, he. When it came to worshiping, they, you know, they sung hymns there, and, and when they would sing hymns, you could just tell he loved to worship, and, and he would, like, do motions with it, and one of his favorite songs was Love Lifted Me, and it was, like, sot and bot, I mean, he would just, like, throw air punches, and he'd be like, ah, you know, so it was awesome to watch him worship, right, but for his birthday one time, um, and, and I still, and I, I have issues about this, right, <clears throat> For his birthday, they had a party for him downstairs, and they played that song, and 
he was muted on the microphones, right? So the speakers that were coming out to the crowd, he was muted. But for the videotape, they unmuted him. And, and so he was the only voice you could hear, right? So my, and, and so when he came down, he wasn't very happy about that. But you could just see, like, he was so into it. Like, every motion that he had. And this was back, you know, in some churches still do, where the pastors sit in the front of the church. I, use, I call them thrones. But uh, where they sit up there on the big chairs. And so when he was singing, it was in front of everybody. Wow. And it was awesome to see the joy in that. But when you saw his face, when he realized, I'm the only voice you can hear. And just because he was excited doesn't mean there's a reason why he was the senior pastor, not the worship pastor, right? There's a reason why I'm the preacher here and not worship, leading worship. There's a reason that, you know, and, and so he's just, he gets embarrassed and angry and all that. But, you know, to this day, you know, I can always remember him and his joy he had in worship for what he was worshiping for. But also to today, no one gets to control my mic except me. <laughs> so my mic is never turned on when we're worshiping. Um, and I know for you that might have happened to watch the awards assembly last two weeks ago. I forgot to turn my mic back on, but nobody no matter what church I go to, I'll be like, I'll turn it on. Don't worry about it. I got you. I'm not going to let anybody do that to me. Um, and, and here's the thing on our hill journeys. We have been touched by grace because of the gift of the gospel. And so that we can share that gift to those around us. We learned that last week, that we're being given the gift so we can use our gifts to share the gift. And the celebration of that gift is worship. It's that big word, worship, that we use. Not a big word, but a word that, that just gets thrown out in a lot of just different conversations like worship this, worship that. But really, the definition of worship is this. To render religious reverence and homage to. Now, notice that definition about worship. It's a, it's a celebration of what what. It's really a celebration, but it's also to show reverence. It doesn't mean that you've got to act reverence in that. We know David in, in the scriptures would dance to God, right? We know David would play new songs to God, and we know a lot of these people that their worship is different. But worship is really a reverence and homage to. It's, it's really a lifestyle. It's, it's like grace. We talked about grace a few weeks ago. It's just like that. It's, it's how you live your life for somebody. It's not just singing the songs that you like or, or a different style of worship if it's more charismatic, if it's more laid back or reverent. It, it doesn't matter what that is. Worship is actually a lifestyle of how you play, how you show reverence and homage to watch you worship. Now, there's many things that we can worship. But for us as followers of Christ, that's what we worship, and that's how we should show reverence and, and homage to is really being obedient, but also for the right thing. So, so in Luke 19, verses 28 through 40, we know Jesus just gave this parable about these, these servants that he gave... Um, that he gave money to. And, and, and so he put them in charge of this gift and to see how they could multiply this gift. And now he is leaving Jericho, right? He's leaving Jericho and he's on his way and he's on the Mount of Olives and he's starting to make his descent into Jerusalem, right? And verse 28 says, And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near Bethpage and Bethany, um, anytime that you see a word that says Beth in front of it, it just means the home of something, right? Bethany is the home of peace. or you know. Um, so he was drawing near to those, those cities. And at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples say, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, Onto which one has never been set. I'm underline that if you've got a Bible out or highlight it in your phones. That um, we're going to come back to that. A colt tied that no one has ever sat. 
untie it, bring it here. If anyone asks why you're untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. Um, that, that's part of some scripture that if you go back, some prophecy scripture in the Old Testament. Verse 32, for those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. I find it interesting that nobody fought that. They just let them take it. There was no fighting with it. Verse 35, and they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road, and he was drawing near. Already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you. If these were silent, the very stones would cry out. You can underline or highlight that part as well. And um, so Jesus finishes his parable and he begins his march to Jerusalem. Uh, and he tells these followers to go get this colt of a donkey. Now, here's what I want you to understand about the colt of a donkey. When somebody was coming into Jerusalem as a, as a victorious, as a Messiah, as a king... Normally, they would find the, the coolest looking, the biggest, strongest horse or chariot that they could ride in, and they would ride victorious. But Jesus tells them to get a colt of a donkey, which brings the two minds of how Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. The first was he was coming in peaceful. He was coming into Jerusalem peaceful. This wasn't a wartime. I'm coming in to get you. I'm not going to show you my pomp and circumstances. I'm coming in peaceful and to bring peace. And the second thing that it showed was, and I'm humbly doing it. I'm not doing it as this king that's forever. I'm going to humbly come to bring you peace. And, and so that's what this entrance to the grand city of Jerusalem was about for Jesus. And then the crowd begins to yell and they begin to sing. His disciples started this chance by saying, Blessed is the king that God has brought into Israel. But we know going back to Matthew and, and, and going to, to, to Mark, and just, you know that they start saying the word Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And, and really this word Hosanna, that, that, that means that just all praise to the king. There was only one other time that, that if you look in some of the scriptures and, and, and especially if you look in a, a different type of Bible and they have the book of Maccabees in there. Right? We don't have the book of Mac, Maccabees in the canon that we and all this that we use but the book of Maccabees tells about the story of the brothers, the brothers Maccabee um, and their victory over the Seclucs. And, and, and what happened was when they, when they won, won, this, won this battle and won this freedom from, from this group of people, you know, you kind of get in the book of Maccabees, you get the story of, of why, why, we, why Jewish people celebrate. Um, I just totally lost it. Christmas time. Hanukkah, yeah, because that's where the, yeah, sorry about that, but... Uh, you know, that's in the book of Maccabees. But also, this victory comes in, and, and, and the brothers Maccabee come riding in, and they start screaming, Hallelujah, or Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Because it's a military victory, and Israel's going to rule the world once again. So here's the thing that the people were worshiping in the Messiah's entry into the holy city they were worshiping Jesus. But they were worshiping more for a military and political sense. For th That's what they wanted. So when he come in and they start saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, they're worshiping Jesus. But they're worshiping Jesus for what they want him to do. And, and they wanted him to be this king and this political and this military king. 
and rather than for being the savior of the world. And here is where the battle for a godly viewpoint is vital. Not because of who we worship, but more for what we worship him for. So two questions as I get rolling this morning. The first one is simply this. How should we worship? What should we worship him for? And the second one is this. Why should we worship? Um, His victory. What should we worship him for? His victory. Have you ever had something that, that you've been doing or, or struggled with and, and when you finally get it working and, and fixed or put together, you just celebrate? Um, I, maybe it's just me. I told you about when I fold clothes and put them away and I have this little mini parade in my brain. But I remember one time we, when we moved into our new house a few years ago, um, there wasn't a key code, or the key code wasn't working on the garage, so we was like, hey, we're going to get a new one, and we're going to put it on there. And we, we, we kept trying to, to get them to recognize each other and all this stuff. And I remember I finally went up, got a stool. I don't, don't ask me why I didn't get my, I have a ladder. I never use the ladder. I usually get the stool out of our kitchen, so I get on the stool, and I finally get it to connect. And I get super excited about it connecting. And... and I come down off of the, off the stool. I didn't fall off the stool. I came down off the stool, and I went, and I threw my arms up, and I backed up and totally ripped the mirror, the, the side mirror off my car. Um, so I was celebrating this, this victory that I had, but then I now had to order a new mirror for the side of my car. Um, but but that we, there's things in our life where we just think, man, you know, I've... I've so selfishly, I've prayed at times when I can't get something working. I'm like, God, just let me fix it or let this screw go in when I need it to go in. It's like the last thing that you got to do. And it happens and you're just like, woo! Right? On these hill journeys, as we're fighting to keep this godly viewpoint, our hearts are this battleground for worship. And not just who we worship, but what we worship for. What we worship them for. Um, in Exodus, this is the story in, in chapter 32 of, of when the Israelites built the, the golden calf, right? Exodus 32, 5 says this, When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be the feast of the Lord, to the Lord. And, and if you look up there, it's capital Lord. So they're talking about God. But this is also the golden calf. So when I was growing up, I always thought this golden calf was just like, ah, we hate God and we're going to worship something else. They made an image of what they thought God should be, and they worshiped that image. It it wasn't just this, this, hey, we made this God. They literally made an image of the God that Moses was talking to on top of Mount Sinai. Because they couldn't see him, Moses could. They thought, we'll make an image, and we'll celebrate, and we'll worship that God. Because this is what we want him to be. And Aaron, the head priest here, said, okay, we'll do it. We'll make a proclamation. We'll put an altar here, and we're going to celebrate, and we're going to worship the feast to the Lord. False gods can also be the reason why we worship. Because we'll only worship the things that he does for us. Don't miss that. A false god isn't just creating a golden image. A false god could be just worshiping what God does for us. Or what we want God to do for us. And and so as these people shouted at Jesus for military and political Hey, king, we want this guy to take over for us. Jesus was coming for a different victory. A victory over the sins of the world which his death, burial, and resurrection secured. That's what his death, burial, and resurrection secured was the victory over death. They worshiped Jesus for what they wanted him to do, but not for what he was going to do and already did. 
Matthew 28, 16 through 17 says this, Now the eleven disciples went to Gal- Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw them, they worshipped him. But some doubted. This is after all this is done. This is after the next four chapters of Luke. That's all we got left. And this is after it's all done, the disciples come up and they start worshiping Jesus, but some of them still doubted. And when they saw the resurrected king, they worshiped, but they still had some doubt. The victory that Jesus took from death is what is to be worshiped. That's why we worship Jesus. It's not because he's going to give us a bunch of stuff and it's not all this because we get heaven one day. We worship Jesus because he laid his life on the line for us. He took the death that we were supposed to have. He lived the life we couldn't live, died the death we should have, and rose from the death death to give us a new life that we could never earn. And he took it from death And that's what we need to worship. That's why we worship God. But sometimes doubts will creep in about where we may be going on this journey. But keeping this victory fresh in our mind will keep worship fresh even in our doubts. I I, opened up a little bit with like what's this craziness going on and and some churches open and some aren't, some all this kind of stuff. But let us never forget that just because we may go in a building to worship, that doesn't mean that worship shouldn't be just as fresh on your couch because actually what Jesus did is what we worship him for. Not that he's going to provide us some victory down the road. He provided the ultimate victory already. And if we keep our minds on that and we keep our viewpoint on that, Victory that he already has, our worship will be fresh no matter where we're at. Even in our doubts. Even in the thing like, God, I don't even know what journey you have me on. Even in those moments of, I don't even know where I'm going. John Piper says this. Why don't people ask about our hope? The answer is probably that we look as if we have hope in the same things that they do. Our lives don't look like they were on a Calvary road stripped down for sacrificial love, serving others with sweet assurance that we don't need to be rewarded in this life. So, What do we worship him for? The victory he gave us on Calvary's road, on the cross and the grave. And that's where our hope comes from. That's that's that homage and that reverence that we give is because of what he did, not because of what we want him to do, but what he did. And so now, we don't have to have hope in the things that the world has hope in. We have hope in the one that has overcome the world. And so why should we worship that choice? Verse 40 talks about the rocks. If I tell the people to be quiet, the rocks will cry out. I love a lot of choices. I um, just read that you know, one of my favorite things to ever do is eat really at a buffet, but let's be honest, it's going to be a very long time before we get to eat a buffet ever again. Even though they were the beginning of sneeze guards. <laughs> but I get it, I understand, but I love buffets, right? Um, I love a lot of choices, but here's the problem with a lot of choices. They can be paralyzing as well. You know, you got your buffets and you're like, man, My sister doesn't like food to touch, so she'll eat a lot of plates because she don't want food to touch each other. Um, But if there's a big buffet, like I I know going out to eat with Nicole, you can just stand there and go, I am, I can't move. I don't even know what to decide. A big menu is the same way for me. If 
now that we can start going back out to eat and all this, that if I sit down and there's like a huge menu, it's like I need more than two minutes and 30 seconds to decide what I want. I've watched my wife many a times freeze on a menu. Freeze. And then I look like that jerk of a guy who's like, well, she'll have this because she just freezes. Right? My famous go-to, here's, your, here's a good line for you guys to use, and it helps you have build rapport with your, your waitress or waiter. If I'm having a hard time and I've been paralyzed by a big menu, I just ask them what their favorite thing is. And I usually get it unless it's something that I don't really like. Um, or you can do this. Look at them and say, pick one or two. One of those two numbers, and then you got to live with whatever that choice is. That's kind of how I do it. Now, there's another thing that's paralyzing for me. I, I've, told, I've talked about this since January. I'm kind of in a rotation year for shoes, right? I'm rotating some out. I'm rotating some in. I haven't got a ton in. Brody got a couple cool pair of shoes. He's close to my size. So the next few that he buys, I'm going to get some hand-me-downs from my son. And so I'm picking them out so I know what I can wear. Um, but here, here's something else a big choice can bother me with, and it's um, gray shoes. You might say, well, why do you mean by gray shoes? I have like five pairs of gray shoes. I've got some, some nice, um, like Chuck Taylors. I've got some nice dress shoes. I've got some nice um, casual tennis shoes. I've got some workout tennis shoes, and they're all gray because you know why? Gray goes with everything. So I wear gray with everything. So, so I love choices, right? And here's the reason why we should worship. He loved us enough by not only living, dying, and raising for us, but he gave us a choice to either follow him or not. To either worship or not. He gave us that choice, right? Um, we, I told you to highlight the Colts. Think about this for, some, for a second. Has anybody out there or in here ever tried to ride something that's never been ridden before? Or sat on something that's never, that you've never sat on before? I don't ride horses because I don't like things that are bigger than me. I like to be able to control. Right? And you might say, well, Eric, everything's taller than you. We talked about that a few weeks ago, all right? But <clears throat> if you've ever tried to get on something that's never been sat on before... Do they just obey and just do whatever? No. I mean, there's, there's a whole sport called bull riding because bulls don't like to be rode. And so this colt of a donkey who is a young, a, just a young adolescent donkey lets Jesus just sit on his back and go. Don't miss that point. Or the, crop, the rocks crying out if the people don't worship. Creation will obey and worship because they have no choice. They are commanded to by the Creator. But here's the thing that creation has been longing for. Creation has been longing for this world to be put back together. So when Jesus is going through Jerusalem, yes, the colt doesn't buck him off because he's the Creator. They have no other choice but to obey and worship. You know, I have thoughts about when he was born in the manger. None of those animals went crazy. I mean, I, I know the cartoons show him actually worshiping. I don't know if that ever happened, but I will tell you that then none of them tried to eat. None of them tried to, I mean, he lived as a baby, so I don't think they went crazy while he was in there. But this colt just let him get on the back, and they let, had no choice but to obey the Creator. And, and as Jesus is coming to, to this grand entrance and this victory that he's going to have over death and putting the world back together, which one day he will come the same path down, and it will be complete. He says if the people are quiet, the rocks will shout out because the creation knew what was happening. They knew the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace. They knew the Creator of the world was walking right through their midst. And if somebody needed to shout, they would have shouted. If 
But we have that choice. We have that choice to follow or not, to worship or not. Revelation 3.20 says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. I just remember old evangelist always saying, He's at the door knocking. Are you going to answer or not? Everything was always a choice with Jesus when it came to humans. Follow me. Seek me. Don't miss that point. We can let him in or not. But this choice needs to be made when fully looking at the victory we have been given by him. A godly viewpoint lets us see that his love is perfect and when it comes time to choose to worship him, it is because of that love he has given us. That's what a godly viewpoint is. We see not only God for what he can do for us, but what he has done for us, but not because of what we want him to do for us. And that his love is perfect even when life's out of control. I always like to use this, and I'm almost done, and the, the, to make my point is when I asked Nicole to marry me, I've told the story before. It was raining. We were going to go for a walk. She called me a dork. It was, oh, it was so cute because um, she called me a dork. Um, it was. It, it was probably the second greatest moment of my life, maybe the third, um, because following Jesus was the first. Probably seeing her walk down the aisle was probably the second. Um, but when I gave her, here's why it's so hard to ask somebody to marry you. Because when you hand that ring and you show them that ring and you say, will you marry me? They have all the power in the relationship to either continue it or not. Any other answer than yes ceases the relationship. And the same is with, with, our Father in heaven and the creator of the world and and, and our personal, our Messiah who came and saved us, any other answer than yes is a no. A wait. Oh, I'll wait till I do this. That's a no. And so why we worship is not only do we worship because of his victory, we have a choice to, to secure it or not. And when you when you choose to follow him, You're not forced like the rocks to worship. But you understand he loved you enough that he would even let you walk away from that. That you understand that, man, that's why. That love is perfect. Martin Luther, the great preacher of old, says this, The sin underneath all of our sins is to trust the lie of the serpent that we cannot trust the love and grace of Christ and we must take matters into our own hands. So here's what happens normally when it comes to this battle of a godly viewpoint through our worship. That we don't trust that victory. And so for me, here's, here's what happens when my heart's not full of joy or when I'm not feeling very pastoral or I'm not feeling very full of worship I'll go to my go-to's some few songs that I'll listen to or I'll get those feelings right right and but I don't go back to the love and grace that I've been given right see worship's more than just that feeling that you get worship is just a total of obedience, reverence, and homage to God. So you need to refresh yourself of what He did for you. And and I'm going to ask Amber to come back up. And As we continue to fight to see a godly viewpoint in our lives, let us worship God through the victory He has given us. And let us choose to see that victory in our lives. 
make no mistake, Jesus knew where he, what he was getting into, and we'll talk about next week. You know, these, these religious leaders of the day told Jesus, basically, tell your people to shut up. Tell them that, that Rome's in control, and if they keep screaming these words, we're going to be in big, big trouble. But Jesus says they can't be quiet. They chose to worship me. All right, so if you're a follower of Jesus, it's not much different than the rocks. execution that's ever been created. He knew that was coming for him, but he knew the victory that was coming after that. And so my two questions as I end, the first is this, have you chosen that victory in your life? Have you chosen to follow Jesus because of the victory he had over your sin? Because the followers of Jesus are promised a new life. Now that new life sometimes can be a struggle because there's a battle with the old. We've talked about that, right? There's a battle of, of the old life and the new life, what we should view, how we should view things. So have you chosen that victory? Have you decided to follow Jesus? I love the old song. I have decided to follow Jesus. Have you chose the victory and chose to to view your life through that victory that you've been given. If not, and you, and you can hear the Spirit talking to you this morning, choose it. You, you can message us. You can, you can call us. You can do whatever you want with, with us. And, and we'll talk to you about the next steps. And the second question is this. How is your worship? How is your worship going lately? Are you like me? Or are you just trying to find that right mood, that right emotion to get you in? And, and you're totally forgetting about what he, what he did for you? Because I can be totally, I've always been totally blunt honest with you guys. I'll tell you how my worship's been. I, it's been great when I get in here and I get to preach. But daily worship, not very good choose to focus on, man, God, it would be a lot better if you let us do this, or if we had a space where we could get together like everybody, if we could do this, and, and I want to worship God for the things I want Him to do for us instead of worshiping for what He's already done for me. So my worship's not really great right now. And the second part of that is, are there other things that affect that worship in your life? Are you in your brain saying, God, if you just give me this, I will praise your name to the end of the world. Or God, if you just give me this. Or God, just bring me out of this. Or God, bring me to this. Or bring this to me. Now, I do believe God will bring good things to his people. But we've got to watch what we worship God for because we end up worshiping, worshiping the creation more than the creator. And that's what affects this worship that we have. It dilutes the victory that we've already been given. If God was to never do anything else other than to send Jesus to die and raise again, that's more than enough. Because we have a new life. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the victory that we have been given through the gospel of your son, through the 
life, death, burial, and resurrection through the life that we've been given as followers. Let us never lose sight of that viewpoint that you want us to have when it comes to worship. Don't let us be about the people like, like on Palm Sunday where, yes, they saw Jesus and they saw his great works and they saw these things that he did, but they also wanted more and they wanted freedom from Rome and they wanted their own kingdom and they wanted all these things. Let us be happy and joyful and reverent and pay homage to the victory that was given to us. When death was because of what death did and we can build our life on that as the songs that we sung in worship let it get us to the viewpoint of the victory that you've given us and Lord I pray for those that are watching that haven't chose to see that to, to follow in that victory I pray right now that they choose that whatever time we have left let us worship few weeks be able to get out um we do know for sure next week we'll be online but after that you'll we'll we'll have that schedule out where we may meet outside we might meet inside um, but we're going to have a schedule down for you guys um, that way we can get together and, and kind of increase that up as we get into august and or july and august and and we'll get that all figured out and so you can have that once again happy memorial day um, celebrate those those lives that have given you the freedom to be able to celebrate that as well. And if you need anything, we are just a message away. So just let us know. See you guys. <laughs>